Hi class, um, I, we are going to do our lecture on chapter 3 today, so this is part 1 of chapter 3. Um, I want to remind you that I'm recording in the middle of this heat wave and I don't have air conditioning, so if you hear some humming going on, there are fans on both sides of me, um, so I'm trying to make this happen. Um, I want to begin with a review of the terms content, form, and use and the term metalinguistic awareness. Um, if we were sitting in an in-person classroom, um, I would have told you anything that I write on the whiteboard behind me is important and fair game. Um, so consider these written on a whiteboard behind me, which is why I'm reviewing them again. Um, I'm also gonna apologize for the glare coming off my glasses. I thought I had that worked out with the lights, but I don't. So content, form, and use. Content. Um, is that part of language that contains the meaning. So under the heading content, we have the terms vocabulary and semantics, which we covered last time. Um, vocabulary being those single words we choose to carry our content and semantics being the, the reason we make those choices. So how words relate to each other. Um, you think of, uh, I'm sure you've all heard the term, um, oh, that's just a semantic difference. Um, meaning there, there is some difference in meaning between the words we may choose to use. Um, the term uh, form is the structure of language. So it's the syntax, phonology, and morphology. Syntax being spoken grammar um, and word order. Um, morphology being the changes within a word that impact meaning. So adding those morphological structures like the endings related to verb tensing or the um, suffixes, prefixes that might be related to change of meaning like uh, making a verb, uh, making a word into an adverb. So adding that LY ending, for example. And then phonology is the structure in the sounds. Now, not how we're making the sounds, but how we can combine certain sounds, the rules around combination of sounds um, to make words. And then um, the, the, the language domain of use. This is how we are using that language in differing situations. So the social norms, um, the, the terms that are underneath this, if I were writing it on the board, are pragmatics and social language. So what are the social norms? Do we have thoughts about who our audience is and does that make us change the words that we may be using or the form we may be using um, <clears throat> or the context that we're in, the social context, does that change what we may be saying? Now there's a whole lot more to it than that, but in a nutshell, those are the domains of language. And then the term metalinguistic awareness. This is, again, the ability to deliberately scrutinize language as our object of attention. So we, as speech pathologists, are engaging in metalinguistic awareness or metalinguistic scrutiny all the time professionally. But um, even as just competent speakers of a language, we do engage in that. Um, in that we can hear something and, and determine does this sound like literate language to us or um, are there some issues with it that may reflect either who this person is or their understanding of the situation they're in. So now on to chapter three. Um, if you don't have your book with you, please pause this and go grab it. Um, you should kind of always have your book with you as you're going through these because I am going to reference pages in the book as we go along. But I'll remind you again, I'm never going to ask you to duplicate a chart or a graph out of the book, um, but they contain really valuable information, both visually and just additional context to what we're talking about. So chapter three, we're looking at the anatomy physiology and to some degree neurology um, of speech and language and we look at this for a reason very much like we needed to look at typical development of speech and language before we can have a discussion about um, how that development is disordered we also need to um, have some basic knowledge about typical body structure and function in order to understand what the impact of disorder may have on that function
Um, this is true if a disorder is present at the time of birth or if it's acquired sometime in the lifetime. Um, our knowledge of structure and function is also significant in predicting the disorder or predicting disorder. Um, and what I mean by that as an example is if we are reading a record review on a, a child that's new to us in school or if we're looking at a chart on a patient at a patient's bedside, um, if we can see how the physical structure has been impacted by a, a disorder of some kind, it'll give us some um, idea going in of what we may see in terms of speech and language. So it could help us focus our assessment, for example, um, and then from that help us focus on building in therapy, knowing what the structure um, is capable of doing. So um, for those of you who've already taken um, anatomy, physiology, and or I don't think any of you have probably taken neurology at this point, but any of you who've taken anatomy and physiology through our department, I am sorry, this is gonna be a big giant review uh, for you of that. If you're currently enrolled in that class, um, you'll find that this information is gonna start off as a review of that. Um, and even for all of you who've probably taken biology and some, some of you physiology, either in high school or as general education, um, courses, you're going to have some review. This is like the one chapter where we're going to use a lot of vocabulary most of you have already heard before. Um, and then some more specific to our field that maybe you haven't. So just up front, some definitions. So we all are on the same page with what we're talking about. The term anatomy. Anatomy refers to the science of um, description of body structure. Okay. Physiology is the science involving description of functions of that body structure. And then neuroscience is the science involving the anatomy, physiology of the nervous system, including the brain. Um, to describe uh, body positioning, body function, body structure within anatomy and physiology, there are some terms specific to that. And they are found in your book on page 85, table 3.1. And I'm just gonna kind of blast through these. Um, these are not something that I expect you to be, to completely memorize, um, but they are terms that you will hear in description, so you kind of have to have a familiarity with what they mean. So an anterior versus posterior, all of these are gonna be um, um, a, a term and it's sort of opposite. So anterior versus posterior means front or back, ventral versus dorsal, ventral being toward the abdomen, dorsal being toward the back, superior versus inferior, top and bottom, internal versus external, outside to inside, those two should be pretty obvious, proximal and distal. Proximal means it's placed toward the interior of the body, distal is placed away from the body. Um, so I always think of that when I, those are, those are terms you hear in the dentist's office all the time. So when he's describing, for example, where he's working on a tooth, if it's toward the interior of your mouth, so on the interior surface, or um, toward the exterior surface, so proximal and distal, proximal and distal, excuse me, and then medial and lateral. And those are terms we'll also use, for example, when describing um, dental structure. So the two big teeth in the middle are medial incisors, then the two next to them are lateral incisors. Um, some other terms that describe neurological organization are afferent with an A and efferent with an E. Afferent is information moving through the nervous system toward the central nervous system. So information coming from the periphery into the central nervous system and efferent is information going from the central nervous system back out to the periphery, moving away from the central nervous system. So we have these two major neurological systems, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system are all of the nerves that go from the brain and spinal cord out to innervate the body and bring then information back in to the central nervous system. There are 12 pairs of nerves that come from the brain um, 
and they are the cranial nerves. And these nerves come out and um, send information to uh, the facial and some into the neck structures. Um, I am there. To, you're going to see those listed in your book. I am not going to ask you to memorize the 12 cranial nerves at this point. We will talk about them a little bit later, um, but I'm not going to ask you to memorize them. Um, right now, I want you to know the terms cranial nerves. They're very important in um, innervation of the structures for speech and language. Um, you will have to memorize them at some point, either in your anatomy and physiology class or in your uh, neurology class later. Um, if you have any intention of working in a more medical setting, that's why you have to memorize them. But for the purposes of this class, I'm not going to ask you to memorize them. Um, there are 31 pair of nerves that emerge from the spinal cord, um, and those are called the spinal nerves, and we won't spend as much time talking about those. Both sets of these um, significant nerves, though, do carry information both to and away from the central nervous system. Remember, the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Um, they carry motor information away, so information instructing body parts how to function, and sensory information back to the brain, so telling back into the central nervous system how something is functioning, how it feels, um, what's happening. The specialized cells that make up the nervous system are called neurons, back to high school biology, right? Um, neurons are, are uh, made up of a cell body with two extensions called dendrites and axons. Dendrites bring information into the neuron and axons carry that information out. Electrical chemical energy moves from neuron to neuron crossing over a space called the synapse or the synaptic cleft. Chemical agents called neurotransmitters carry that information across the synapse. Myelin is a sheath that coats the neurons. It's extremely important. It aids in that transmission and provides some protection to the neuron itself. The growth of myelin is called myelinization, and it's not complete in a developing person until late childhood. Um, and if there is incomplete growth of the myelin coating, or if there's some um, loss of myelin, it can and does result in significant neurological problems. So for example, multiple sclerosis is a disorder that um, is impacted by uh, loss of my, that myelin coating. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the brain. Um, in your books on page 89, there's an illustration of the brain that um, will help you in, in hearing this information. Um, there are three major parts of the brain. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, the first is the brain stem, and anatomically, the brain stem sits on top of the spinal cord and it provides communication between the brain and the spinal cord. It's mostly made up of nerve tracks. So you just think of it as the cables going between, the electrical cables basically, um, if you will, going between the brain and the spinal cord. Um, it has three, it holds the three major reflex centers. It's very important, so I don't wanna minimize it by saying it's just made up of these tracks. The three major reflex centers within the brain stem are the cardiac center, the vasomotor center, and the respiratory center. So you can see it's extremely significant to um, life itself. The cerebellum is the next uh, part of the brain, and it's called the little brain. It's its nickname. If you look at it, it does look like a little miniature version of the entire brain. And it sits posterior, so toward the back, and just above the brain stem. <clears throat> It is primarily responsible for regulating motor and muscle activity. So when you go to the gym, your cerebellum is very active because it coordinates movement, um, maintenance of muscle tone, posture, equilibrium. All of that information is kind of coordinated um, right there in the cerebellum. Um, but recent research um, has indicated that the cerebellum its function was thought to be limited to that neuromuscular function, but it also now is showing that there's link to the neural connections involved 
with higher order cognitive functions, such as short-term memory and behavior modulation and to some degree expressive language. Um, the next and biggest uh, division of the brain is the cerebrum. Um, and it's what you think of when you picture brain. The cerebrum, the largest of the major divisions. It consists of two hemispheres that are connected by a structure called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum allows communication between the two hemispheres of the brain. Each, um, each of the hemispheres within the cerebrum is divided into four lobes. Um, so there are obviously eight in total, and this in your book is on page 90, figure 3.4. Um, we're going to talk mostly about the left hemisphere of the brain and describing function. You'll see I'll bring the right up um, in one area, but um, for most of our discussion of speech language, we're going to be concentrating on the left hemisphere. So the, the four lobes are the frontal lobe, which sits just behind the forehead, and it has two primary functions. The first is to initiate and regulate fine complex muscle activity or motor activity. Anytime I use the word motor, I'm talking about muscle movement. Um, and speech definitely fits that description. If you remember, speech is a muscular function, neuromuscular function, um, oral muscular function, and um, it is very complex. So it's the frontal lobe that's helping us um, with that fine motor movement. The second function of the frontal lobe is to control executive functioning. So those problem solving, planning, reasoning, decision making, um, some of social awareness, rational thought, controlled a lot in the frontal lobe. The prefrontal cortex now within that frontal lobe um, is connected with all of the other sensory and motor systems of the brain. It seems that this is the focus of synthesizing all of those functions um, that allow us as humans to not just respond reflexively or habitually, but to be able to reason and plan so that we can think and act with intentionality. Um, that's all controlled up there in the prefrontal cortex. Um, another area within that frontal lobe that's significant for us is called Broca's area, Broca, B-R-O-C-A, possessive, Broca's area. Um, it is, again, within the frontal lobe of the left hemisphere. It is responsible for that fine coordination of speech output. So therefore, a person presenting with damage to the left frontal lobe of the brain, specifically in Broca's area, either from uh, stroke, which we're going to use the acronym CVA, cardiovascular accident, it's most typically a stroke, um, or other damaging event, damaging neurologically to Broca's area, will very specifically result in impaired speech production. Um, Remember, speech is different than language in that speech is a motor production, whereas language is a cognitive function. Um, the second lobe in the brain is the uh, parietal lobe. It sits posterior, so in back of the frontal lobe, just above the ears. Um, and its key functions are to perceive and integrate sensory and perceptual information, so making sense of what we're seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, um, and to comprehend oral and written language and math calculations. So again, it's important to us because it aids in processing um, all of that visual input in, in um, written language, math calculation, and then some, to some degree in comprehending oral information. Not as much as the next lobe, which we're going to get to right now. The next lobe is the temporal lobe. It is, again, posterior to the frontal lobe, but inferior to the parietal lobe. So if you think of it as sitting medial to the ears. Um, in each hemisphere, now not just the left, but in each hemisphere, within the temporal lobe is a structure called the auditory cortex, or Heschel's gyrus, because we like to give things two names. Um, so the auditory cortex 
Heschel's gyrus, they mean the same thing. Um, within the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe in both hemispheres is where analysis of sound happens. Our brains process sound information in both hemispheres. Hold on, I've got to log back into my computer. Hi. I have no idea if the camera keeps going when my computer logs off or not, so if that's a weird interruption to you, I'm sorry. Um, we were saying that analysis of sound happens. Our brain processes sound information in both hemispheres, but it does seem as if there is a specialization for the finer and more complex features of speech sound processing within the left hemisphere. Um, this specialization for speech is called temporal processing. Um, temporal should be a word that triggers to you. It's talking about time. And that's because when we're processing auditory stimulation over time, we have to be able to distinguish speech from the other noises we may be hearing around us. So temporal processing happens in the left auditory cortex. Um, the right auditory cortex is much more significant in interpreting things like melody and prosody and some aspects of pitch. So it's helping us hear the melody and the rhythm of, of, muse, of, excuse me, of the sounds around us. Um, also in the left temporal lobe is an area called Wernicke's area. Um, again, another one of those possessive words because it's named after, after Dr. Wernicke. Um, this is the area that is the specialized site for language comprehension. It's connected to Heschel's gyrus or to that auditory cortex by neural pathways. Heschel's gyrus processes speech sound and then passes that information into Wernicke's area. In Wernicke's area, that processed information is now turned into comprehension of language. So remember again, speech is a neuromuscular process, different from language, which is a cognitive process. However, it is most typical that speech is the means of conveying that language. Um, so that's why the temporal lobe is so significant in comprehension of that language. So any damage to Wernicke's area within the temporal lobe, excuse me, I have to check something before I move on. Um, any damage to Wernicke's area is going to significantly impact the ability to comprehend both spoken and written language. The fourth lobe then is the occipital lobe and it sits at the rear of the cerebral cortex in front of and above the cerebellum. The occipital lobe receives and processes visual information. Is that significant to us? Of course it is. Um, it's significant in terms of our being able to read. Um, it's also significant in terms of our being able to interpret what's going on visually around us. Um, visual information in this, the, the sense of things like uh, facial expression or proximity or just the visual context of what we're in also contributes to language comprehension. Now the brain has some remarkable organizational features that we're going to talk about next, the organizational principles within the brain. The first is interconnectedness. Um, both hemispheres, I said this earlier, of the brain are connected and they are constantly integrating information back and forth through that corpus callosum. So for example, while we know that in Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe, there is a um, specific function of language comprehension, it's also constantly receiving information from the right auditory cortex regarding melody and prosody that aids in that comprehension, as well as from the occipital lobe regarding facial expression and positioning and visual context, all of that um, is, is being communicated at the same time. So Wernicke's area then must also communicate with the frontal lobe to make use of its specialization for those higher order functions, um, things like solving and reasoning and planning. 
memory is stored throughout the brain and we are constantly accessing memory as we are formulating or interpreting messages. Um, the second um, organizational principle is hierarchy. All human behaviors have to pass through the central nervous system. No two body parts can communicate with each other without involvement of the central nervous system. So um, the more complex the behavior of a body part, the more the brain has to be involved. Um, so for example, we're all dealing with the mosquitoes right now. If you have a mosquito bite on your ankle and it's really bothering you and you need to touch it or you know you really shouldn't scratch it but if you need to touch it for some reason you can't your ankle can't say to your hand hey please come help me out that has to go through the central nervous system first um, and then be communicated to the hand um, so hierarchy everything happens within a hierarchy the third um, organizational principle is specialization um, although the parts of the brain are completely interconnected, there are definitely areas of specialization. And we've already talked about things like Broca's and Wernicke's and um, the uh, auditory cortex. The two hemispheres function differently and the lobes within them each have areas of specialty. Sometime, uh, recent research is finding that even nerve cells themselves can have some specialized function. The brain, by the way, is still uh, an early area of study. While we have learned so much about it in, um, I'll say, the last century, um, there's still so much more to know. There's still a lot of areas of mystery. Um, the fourth organizational principle is plasticity or change. Um, the ability of the brain to reorganize and modify functions and to adapt to internal and external change or information. Now I'm sure you've all heard the term brain plasticity before. It's a term that kind of floats around out there in the general public in terms of, you know, if there's some kind of damage to the brain, the brain has some plasticity, ability to repair itself. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. It's not as big um, a factor, as positive a factor as some people would like it to be, um, but there is some truth to it. So there are, we're gonna talk about three different kinds of plasticity of the brain. <clears throat> Excuse me, the first one is developmental plasticity. Um, and this is just the ability for there to be neural organization secondary to sensory experiences. So this is the plasticity that's involved in typical development or in any kind of development. So for example, hearing the language of your parents, of your community, um, results in um, the development of language, changes in neural structure to help you now hold on to that language and make it your own. The next type of plasticity is learning plasticity. So I wanna make sure you're understanding the difference between these two. Learning plasticity happens as a result of direct learning or instruction. Um, so one thing I'm pretty sure I said last week is language learning in terms of your native language happens in the air. We don't sit down with our children and very explicitly teach them language. They happen to hear it all around them. That's developmental plasticity. Learning plasticity is the direct result of instruction um, or of some specific hearing. Um, so for example, um, playing the piano. I, my husband plays the piano, so I do get to listen to the piano played often. Um, I also listen to beautiful recordings of piano music. Just from listening, am I going to learn to play the piano? No, I wish that was the case. So that is not developmental plasticity that caused these wonderful pianists to be able to do that. It's learning plasticity that helped with that neural organization for them to be able to learn this new skill. So learning plasticity is the result of learning or instruction. And then injury-induced plasticity is reorganization um, to a much, much lesser degree, regeneration after an injury. So the idea that um, if someone loses their sight, um, it'll be, they'll have better hearing. Um, not really the case. Now, there may be some uh, um, 
ability to to tune into things that they're hearing more simply because they've lost their sight, but it's not going to necessarily improve their hearing. Injury-induced plasticity is more what we think of as what happens when we now apply therapy to a situation. So think of a physical therapist. I think that's more relatable to everybody at the moment. Um, If there's some physical injury, you go to a physical therapist. Now, they're not going to help the bone reheal or um, you know, regenerate anything neurologically, but they are going to help retrain movement. Um, so we're going to have plasticity in terms of going back and reorganizing that, uh, the neural information about muscle movement to make an improvement in function. And, and to some degree, speech therapy is also about that, whereas language therapy is more about learning plasticity, to some degree, um, injury um, induced plasticity. The fifth um, organizational principle is the critical period. This is the period of time in which growth of a particular function or structure is the most rapid. Um, and it's during critical periods that very specific neurons are growing most rapidly and establish those important neural pathways. So three to four weeks after conception, when many women don't even know they are pregnant, um, is when the neurons are migrating to form the inner structures and functions of the brain. This is a critical period of neural development Um, and is at significant risk from prenatal behaviors such as drug and alcohol abuse. And significant disabilities can be the result of um, those behaviors in the developing infant, the developing, um, yeah, infant. The critical period for language learning extends from the prenatal period through puberty. So those are when all of that um, developmental plasticity is happening, learning plasticity is happening, um, and the neurons are migrating to form those important pathways for language learning. Um, Contralaterality is not listed in the list of organizational principles, but it is an important principle of Uh, brain structure and what you need to know about that is it just means that bodily senses and functions are processed in the opposite side of the brain. So if there's damage to the left hemisphere of the brain, we can expect paralysis or paresis, uh, maybe loss of some um, sensory information on the right side of the body. Um, That's enough about that. So Broca's area, again, specializes in the fluent expression of speech Um, the fine muscle coordination needed for intelligible speech. Broca's area is in the left frontal lobe. Um, Heschel's gyrus, the auditory cortex, is where we have auditory perception and sensation. It interprets all kinds of sounds, not just speech, but in the left temporal lobe, it specializes in speech.